citizenship and civil society, and scholarship on the rescaling of politics and urban governance. As a political sociologist, she approached both labor, migration, and civil society dynamics as empirical fields for analyzing transformation in the way in which state politics and associated institutions, such as citizenship and governance, are organized, conceived, put in practice, and contest. Um, she has published extensively in journals like International Migration Review, uh, Political Geography, Gender and Society, and so on. Uh, she's the author of more than 20 referred book chapters, uh, uh, two collective uh, volumes as co-editor and co-author of a book called Migrant and Workers, The Political Economy of Labor Migration in Israel. And she's currently com completing a two years project on planning decision and the construction of public interest, co-direct with Talia Margalit, if I'm not wrong. Uh, her latest research is titled Do Papers Matter? Uh, legal Liminality in the Life Course of Migrant Workers and Refugees Children in Israel, and the title of her lecture today, that's part of the broader comparative research on civil society, uh, social and moral agency, and its role in the shaping of migration policy in ethnic non-immigration regime, as called, as you can see in the back, Labor Migrants' Right to Family Life Between State and Social Biopolitics. I will not take longer, and I let the floor to Adriana Kemp. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Hola, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so, as Lorenzo said, actually, I'm a political sociologist. This is the way I'm, I'm approaching these issues of uh, labor migration. And the, my talk today is part of the two things about which I'm I've been working about for a long time. One is labor migration policies. One is policies that are directing migration, labor migrations, both documented and undocumented, on the one hand, and on the other, a civil society, the politics of uh, everyday organization in civil society, the sociology of NGOs, uh, mainly NGOs doing advocacy for uh, the human rights of uh, uh, labor migrants, but also social movements uh, or social movement networks. So today I want to bring them together in a way that uh, extends the scholarship on domestic and care work, labor migration has not done uh, that much. So let me uh, um, show you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, tensions between two things. One is be between the migrant women coming to do the care or reproductive labor uh, uh, mainly in middle class houses in uh, quite affluent uh, societies and economies, and how they stand in tension with the, their own reproductive rights to have a family life and to take care of their families. And the, um, the main point of my talk today is know how they take care of their families and uh, how they materialize their reproductive rights back in their homes through, for example, transnational families, something that has, written, has been written a lot about, but how do they take, how do they materialize their own reproductive rights in situ, in the destination countries? And this is the main point that I'll be addressing here. Uh, my main question is actually who cares for whom and why, and what are the results for migrants and for society. If you want my talk, it's about caring and the politics of caring. And my main argument, this is the spoiler at the beginning, okay, up in your face. My main argument is something that I'm actually maintaining a dialogue with other people that are thinking along the same lines, Fiona Williams would be one of them, is that if we really want to understand the current politics of care, of global care, we should take into account not only state policies and market uh, uh, actions and interests, but we should take into account seriously also how state politics, politics and markets intersect with ethical claims on the needs and rights of migrant care workers, ethical claims that are mobilized from below, from civil society groups, organizations, and networks. 
which means also the other side of this argument is it means that also social movement organizations and NGOs, this is something that is very well known, are also part of the governance of a global care and the politics of global care. So this is what I'm going to do in, in the, I have an hour more or less, this is what I'll try to do. Uh, first of all, just definitional issues, concepts, not everybody comes from sociology, so wh what, what do I mean by care work? Uh, then how are care work, migration and gender related? How do they relate uh, to each other? Then who migrates for care work and where to? Why and how are care workers accepted? And then I will present to you the Israeli case for what is a global issue. My main point will not be to make the particular case or the specifics about the Israeli case, but actually to try to think global issues, issues that are going on somewhere else and that they have a global purchase through the particular particularities of the Israeli case. So if you have questions about what is particular about Israel, I will be glad afterwards to discuss them. So just for definitions, care or reproductive labor, it's part of a broad project of social reproduction. Again, it means actually how we take care of others, but also at the same time of the social system. Okay, if I use uh, the definition I like best of what is reproductive labor is taken by a, a, a Nakano Glenn that she said that actually it's a type of labor that comprises three components. The first component is biological reproduction of human beings. If you want sexual labor, okay, how do we reproduce ourselves? Okay, into others. The second component is the, uh, it's actually the physical and emotional care labor, okay? It's the maintenance of individuals through their life cycle. And this will be very relevant to my talk today because these migrant women are migrating actually to take care of the physical and emotional maintenance mainly of our elders, our children, the handicaps, and all the, those that are in need. And the third, component of reproductive labor, which is integral to it, is the systemic reproduction, okay? Education, social bonds, and ties. The systemic reproduction that enables the social system to be sustained. So if we understand reproductive labor in this way, it's obvious that it's part of a biopolitics, okay? Both as a rational of uh, governance but also as a technology, an individualized technology of self, of subjectivity. Now, the, when we talk about reproductive labor, it, it sounds a little bit like a oxymoronic, like a contradiction terms, because when we think about reproduction, okay, and we think, for, we think mainly about the private sphere, we think about a type of uh, things that we do, a type of social actions that are motivated by other than market values and other than market interest. For example, the emotional, okay? So how can the emotional be at the same time part of a job? Well, definitely it can, and uh, it can, and the reproductive labor brings together, if you want, two things that on principle they are supposed to be inimical or antithetical to each other, which is productive labor, market labor, market value, together with all the things that are non-marketable or that we thought that they were non-marketable, okay? And this is important because it always comes when we talk about the care labor, okay? It always uh, brings in the question, but is care labor a job like any other job? I mean, can a person really work 24 hours taking care of others? Perhaps part of the time she's sitting there and watching soap operas. Why should we pay her for that? So this is a question that uh, uh, keeps on uh, coming back. Now, the uh, issue of uh, in, the, in the recent decades, this has been going on already for decades, we see from the migration point of view, we see two trends that intersect together to bring into what we call the feminization of care migration. 
uh, the, two, the, two, the two trends are, on the one hand, the increasing commodification of care, the fact that care, taking care of ourselves and of others, has become a commodity, okay? Uh, that it's evaluated according to its market value. This is one uh, 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 trend. And the other trend, which is autonomous but is interrelated, is the increasing feminization of migration. So let me just explain each one of them very briefly. Commodification of care, commodification of care. Why care and how care has become a commodity? Uh, it, it is relating to many, many reasons that not all of them have to do necessarily with migration, okay? Uh, one of them is uh, changes in gender regimes, okay? When I talk about gender regimes, I talk, I'm talking about roles, perceptions, and gender relations. What we have been seeing in many, many different places is the increasing incorporation of women in paid labor, but the increasing incorporation of women in paid labor in the, mer in, in the labor market doesn't mean that we have changed the gender division of labor. Still at home, we have a second shift, okay? Or we have to pay for someone else to do the second shift that we used to do. And the other process uh, that has brought into the increasing commodification of care is uh, changes in welfare regimes. And to make a long story short, mainly it will be the neoliberalization of welfare regimes. The fact that things that before that perhaps states took care of or, mar or uh, communities or families took care of, nowadays we are paying for them. So nowadays, care is brought into the market and welfare is brought into the market. We have to pay for the social services that once were provided by uh, others and were non-marketable, okay? That were provided to us as citizens. Uh, the feminization of migration is another trend, okay? The feminization of migration, it means that more women are migrating and more importantly, it's not just the more women are migrating than before, but they are doing that autonomously. They are doing that not as dependent, not necessarily in the framework of family reunification. And the uh, migration for care and domestic work is a, a, a very important catalyst for the feminization of uh, migration, okay? The feminization of migration is also a gendering of migration. It's not just that more women statistically are uh, migrating and are mi migrating alone, but it's also something that it's deeper, it's more structural. It means that, for example, migration policies, and I'll show it to you through this Israeli case, labor migration policies are gendered. They are opening different tracks for men and women, okay? Also, deportation, by the, by the way, is highly gender, deportation and detention. Okay, so as I said, these two different processes converge into the increasing feminization of care migration that, uh, for example, if we look at the uh, number of uh, women migrating to do the care work and the domestic work, we see that uh, out of uh, 11.5 million migrant domestic workers, 7.7%, uh, 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 which are 7.7% uh, of all migrant workers worldwide, the vast majority are women, 73% uh, uh, of all migrant domestic workers are women, okay? And they are making actually 7.7% of all migrant workers worldwide. Where do female care workers migrate to? So there are mainly three uh, regions uh, or three sub-regions that, that are the main destination uh, uh, places for domestic uh, care workers, domestic and care uh, 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 migrants. Uh, one of them, actually the largest one, is uh, Southeastern Asia. 
in the Pacific, which means that actually it's 24%, which means that actually we're having here a regional system of migration because many of the uh, domestic and care workers, not all of them, but many of them, they do come from the same area and actually they are staying, they are migrating and doing labor migration in the same sub areas. The second a large sub-region would be northern, southern, and western Europe. It's bringing all of it together. And the third one, and a very important one, 90% of the migrant workers working in, in domestic and care work, they go to Middle Eastern countries. And I would include Israel within the Middle Eastern countries. Israel doesn't like to be referred to as part of the Middle East, after today, you will see why Israel really belongs to the Middle East, okay? So why and how are care workers accepted in countries of destination? There are two main explanations. I will go through them briefly because I guess that you must know them. And if you don't, please ask me later on, okay? So one very dominant approach to explain how does it happen, okay, the feminization of uh, care migration, these global uh, uh, women, okay, domestic women, is uh, one that has been offered in the US mainly by Rasel Salazar Parrenias and by Arli Ochchild. Does it ring a bell? These names ring a bell? Okay, if you are more curious about that later on, I will be glad to give you the references. So, so for example, Arli Ochchal, she, she, she talks about global care chains, okay? She says that actually socioeconomic restructuring, reshaping, both in the global south, and this is a generalization, okay? In the global south and in affluent economies in the global north, create a new international division of reproductive labor. It's like world system theory, but regarding reproductive labor, okay? And what she says is the following, Parenias actually adds to that, is this, this global care chains or, and this international division of reproductive labor means that a privileged woman, a well-off woman in the affluent economies, pays a migrant woman to perform reproductive labor and she, in turn, passes on her own reproductive labor to others left behind in her, in her country of origin, which means something ha someone has to take care of the kids of the caretaker, okay? Now, alongside the labor transfer, there is also transfer of emotional surplus value linking women from different classes. This has always happened. But the new thing is that now women are being linked not just across classes, but also across national boundaries, across different nation states in an unequal and yet inter interdependent relationship. The other response, the other approach explaining why there is a feminization of care migration or that points at a different angle to look at that, it says, okay, so in capitalism, okay, and in global capitalism, in the global face of capitalism, so we also actually trade with emotions across borders, okay? But uh, then you have approaches that are asking, okay, but we live not only in markets, we, li we live also in states. Someone has to open the door for the migrant women to come. It's not enough to have markets. So the other approach is a state-centered approach. And state-centered approach is very good because they bring in the institu institutional view of how, given that there is actually transnationalization of care work, why in different places women, migrant women, face different conditions. Okay, so a state-centered approach would, for example, look at the, at the following parameters. For example, a state-centered approach would ask, okay, what is the gender regime in the state, in the country of destination? Okay, it's more segregative or it's more equal? This would be important, for example, for laws, for labor laws, for employment laws, for uh, laws against violence and abuse and so on. Uh, or, for example, another parameter, important parameter, is in the country, the destination, 
what is the welfare regime? Okay, you, you study at the uh, Pompeo Fabre and Gosta Esping Anderson is in the Pompeo Fabre, so he coined this notion of welfare regime in different uh, uh, countries. We have different welfare regimes. Is this more market-based regime which will be uh, in which we can see that everything is actually evaluated through the market value or is more, it is more statist? state center, it is more corporatist or familial. And then we, sh we have to look, and this is very important, what is the migration and citizenship regime? This will actually, to a great extent, determine whether the women that are coming to work, whether they do have, for example, the possibility to move from working in the domestic and care workers into better jobs or whether, for example, they and their families, their kids, for example, will have the possibility for family reunification, or if they have kids that are born there, whether they will apply or use SOLI, okay, it means laws that, uh, of birth that uh, give you citizenship upon birth or not, okay? So Israel, and here I'm getting to the Israeli case, I think it's an interesting case study because it, ga it goes against all odds. First of all, it's a highly familial society. Okay, the average, the average of a, a birth of kids per family is 3.5. Okay, and uh, which is pretty high, definitely. Okay, then also it's a quite centra centralized and neoliberal welfare state. Okay, so what has been neoliberalized is the state itself, okay, and the way the state has incorporated the market, okay, and private actors. The third thing that I think is crucial here in this context, mainly when we talk about the family life of migrant workers, is that it's a highly exclusivistic ethno-national migration and citizenship uh, regime. It's not easy to get access. It's almost impossible to get access to a citizenship if you do not belong to the dominant ethno-national group, which is being Jews, Jewish. So this goes against all odds for actually being a system that would want to come to bring and to recruit a, a foreign a labor a migrants. And yet, Israel is a destination, actually it's a major destination country for women, migrant women working in the, domestic, in the care uh, uh, and reproductive jobs. So how has it happened, why, and what are actually the consequences and the results of all this? So just Briefly, for those of us that don't know very much about the Israeli context, very, very uh, uh, briefly. So Israel, it's a country oh, with a population of 8.3 million residents within the Green Line, okay? Not including the occupied territories, okay? There is a, a, the majority, there is a majority of 79% uh, of mainly people that are Jews or can claim some connection uh, to Judaism, uh, and a, a large, a sizable minority of Arab or Palestinian citizens within Israel of uh, 70, 17, 17 percent, and then there is a three percent minority that are classified as others. That would be mainly. Christian, non-Muslim, not necessarily Christian Arabs, but Christians in general. If you have questions about those Christian in general, I will gladly answer later on. And then, not part of this, not part of these statistics, which are the official statistics, there are separate statistics for foreigners. So who are the foreigners? We're talking about roughly, these are official estimations, okay? of 225,000 migrants non-citizens, which includes a, a, the blue one you can see here. Does it have a line? Well, here, the blue one, it's mainly undocumented, okay? Undocumented. 
then the, um, the yellow one are labor migrants that are officially recruited, that are invited to come within the framework of temporary labor schemes. And the green, the green ones are refugees and asylum seekers, which started coming in Israel in considerable numbers in the mid of the 2000, in 2005 and up until 2013. So, so what we are actually seeing is that a country that was mainly a country for the immigration of Jews and that for many years until the 90s knew mainly the influx of migratory waves of a, what we call ethnic return migration of Jews, okay, uh, which upon arrival they got citizenship automatically, since the 90s, in 1991, if you want to be exact, we are seeing the influx of uh, immigrants uh, that are non-Jews and they are not Palestinians. So what we have in here is a new category, a new minority, if you want, of what I call non-Jews and non-Palestinians in Israel. This is where I make a career out of. This is where I focus. This is where all my research focuses, okay? And of course, the income of these non-Jewish and non-Palestinian uh, 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 immigrants, actually, uh, they offer a new addition to an already complex, highly divided uh, uh, society, okay? With many, many different type of social boundaries. Who are they? Where do they come from? To which sectors do they go? I will be talking today specifically about the labor migrants, okay? And not about the asylum seekers and the refugees. So some general data, and I, these two graphs actually, which are a little bit dated, one is from, is from 96 and the other one is for, for 10 years later in 2006, but they are very accurate because they show the type of transformations that have gone through in, in the sectors in which a, a, a labor migrants are being incorporated. So if at the beginning the largest sector by far was construction, and which is this one, the big, big black one, okay, and then agriculture, and care work was a tiny one, a domestic care was a, a tiny one. Ten years later, we see exactly the opposite. The care work has become the, by far the largest uh, sector in which labor migrants are recruited and are working, whereas a, a, a agriculture has remained stable and construction has become much, much uh, smaller. This is important for our discussion because it means that actually what we are seeing here is an increasing feminization of labor migration flows because who is working in the domestic and care workers? The vast majority, over 80% of them are women. So it means that at any moment, every year in Israel, you're having something like 60,000 women that they are coming to work in care and domestic work in Israel, and they make the vast majority of invited labor migrants, labor migrants with permits, okay, that there are 90,000, okay? So the major trends, uh, so social demographic trends that we find in Israel nowadays is, as I said, the rapid uh, uh, simultaneous growth sorry, a, an increasing feminization of labor migration flows. Another thing that could be of interest to some of you is that the rapid growth in numbers of permits for labor migrants from abroad came at the expense of the number of Palestinians from the West Bank and formerly from Gaza that used to work in Israel. This was very uh, vivid seen during the 90s. Now it has changed again. Now, Palestinians from the West Bank are reincorporated in the labor market, mainly working in construction and in the light industry in Israel. Something like 50,000 permits are annually issued to a, a Palestinians from the West Bank to work in Israel, not for, from Gaza. Not from Gaza, definitely. Now, where do they come from? Mainly, mainly, Labor migrants come mainly from Asian countries, 
the vast majority from Philippines and Thailand, and there are also from uh, other places uh, 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 that uh, uh, work uh, uh, from, uh, mainly from Eastern Europe. Another thing that we see that this has remained stable uh, across the years is that uh, people without papers, whether because they came without papers or because they uh, lost their papers, they overstayed their visa, they are making up until today in a quite, quite stable way 60% of the total of labor migrants. Okay? And there is a great overlap between those that came with visa or are officially recruited and the unauthorized, which means that the system is producing the uh, undocumented. Okay, so how did it happen? I don't have much time to talk about it, but what I'll mention is that Israel actually in the 90s has instituted a guest worker program, not very, uh, uh, quite similar actually to the guest worker programs or the temporary labor migration schemes uh, that were pretty uh, classic after the Second World War in Western Europe, and those that are very much uh, standing today in many of the Middle, uh, Middle Eastern countries, okay, and in Southeast Asia. So, so here you have a, a picture. For me, it's obvious. It's a bad picture in the sense that we are seeing just a woman from its back and a man from its back. For me, it's so clear that she's from the Philippines, okay, and so this is a quiet thing. It's, you go to, nowadays to the parks, not only in Tel Aviv, but in any city, middle-sized, large city, and even in small, uh, in small places, okay, even in kibbutz, okay, and you will see that uh, in the parks, in the bus stations, okay, and in the benches, in the public benches, in the public space, you will see always an elderly and a Filipino Filipino women, they actually congregate together. This is a, a very usual scene. Uh, and this is for, from a market in South Tel Aviv, you know, a, a market, a street market on a Saturday a, a afternoon, which is also the day of mass going to church. So who are the caregivers in Israel? I said 60,000 of them, they are currently employed with permits. And a similar number, I guess, would be without permits. 80% of them are women. 50% come from the Philippines. And the rest come from Nepal, from India, Sri Lanka, eh, Moldova, and from other Eastern European countries. Eh, we know that the offshore foreign work from the Philippines is a key to the Philippines' economic strategy, actually. This is important. Out of 1.4 1, 1. million labor, Philippines exports, okay, 1.4 million people to do, to work in different type of jobs. Among the service sector, which is the top sector for which labor migrants from Philippines are working around the, the world, we have different subsectors. The, uh, for example, okay, those that are working in household service, as household service workers and as uh, uh, skilled nurses, the vast majority of them go to Hong Kong, Kuwait, to the United Arab Emirates, and to Saudi Arabia. Those that are working on care worker, okay, on care work mainly, they go mainly to places like Taiwan, Singapore, and Japan, Canada, and in Middle East, to Israel, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar, and in Europe, to Italy, Greece, and Spain. The top destinations for the Filipino women working in the care work are three, Taiwan, Israel, and Canada. So Israel is a small country. The numbers may seem not so big for you, but it's a top destination for Filipino uh, women. Uh, how did it happen? OK, so how am I with time? I'm OK with time? Yeah. Give me just an estimation. Ten minutes, okay, so very quickly. How did it happen? Well, 
it didn't happen naturally because of needs, okay? I talk about the restructuration of the welfare regime, okay? In Israel, the thing happened, it was called actually the Filipino plan. So it was very clear from the beginning to policymakers what would be the solution for a very progressive, a very progressive social insurance law that they passed. In 1988, the parliament in Israel passed a law that I think that it's really model law because it's a law that said, instituted for the first time in Israel, that a, a having people taking care of us in our homes and not in a home, not being removed to a, a geriatric institution, but having people come in to take care of us, it's a right. It's a social right. And that the state will actually pay for that. Okay, as it pays social insurance, okay? The thing is that it's very costly. So the question would be, who would do that? How can you bring someone that will be 24 seven taking care of you and pay her the minimum wage? Okay, this is really something that arithmetics don't work. So here, the law was passed in 1988, and actually they could not implement them as many beautiful laws that are not implemented. But it was implemented, the solution was found by the finance minister in 1995 when they instituted the Filipino plan that they said, listen, we will actually pay but we will condition that actually on bringing someone. We will not give the money to the family to do whatever the family wants. We will pay uh, to bring someone, okay? To bring someone, and of course, bringing someone was bringing someone from a law, uh, from abroad, which allowed actually to, uh, for women to come work 24/7 and get the minimum wage. Actually. Women recruited to work in uh, reproductive and domestic work, they are bound to, they have to live in, to live in the house of the people that are taking care of. They cannot live out. During the weekend, they have one day in which they rent a flat with other friends, something that is very common also in other places. Okay, so actually, to make a long story short, the blueprint. Uh, the the uh, uh, temporary migration scheme that Israel established follow the blueprint of most of the guest worker programs or the temporary migration schemes. We know very well this, uh, 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 this blueprint, bring workers when needed, return them when not needed. Uh, the Israeli labor migration policies actually they follow a mixed model on the one hand. They are very similar to those that are instituted in the Middle East countries and in, in East Asia. They actually they are very generous in giving permit, in establishing very high quotas. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, they, so they are, they are not controlling the outer border. It's what I called uh, soft in the outside, hard in the inside. Bring as many migrant workers as you can. Actually, there are no limit quotas. Once they're in, you do the controlling in. For example, by binding them to an employer. Okay, so you come, the permit is given not to you personally, but to an employer. It means that if you are getting abused by the employer, but you want to leave him or her, it means that you become undocumented. This has been a big issue that has been brought into court. The High Court of Justice abolished it, but on the ground, things still, you know, the binding on the ground still exists. On the other hand, you know, uh, the uh, labor migrants are covered by labor laws. Most labor, all labor laws apply to them, and many of the social insurance clauses or, or laws uh, are also applicable to labor migrants, and Israel is signatory to international conventions on human rights that are relevant for migrants. And uh, migrants have standing in courts, in labor courts, but also in uh, higher instances of the courts. So as I said, the, the logic, the governance logic is soft in the, inside, in the outside, bring them in. Once they are in, that's where the control takes place. The, the control does not take place in the border, but inside. And of course, there are many tensions, okay, between this soft in the outside, 
okay, and hard in the inside. One of the places where the, which are parallel to the tensions that we know between markets wanting cheap workers and states wanting to control who is coming in. This is very well known. One of the places where the tensions between the soft in the outside and hard in the inside comes about very clearly is in the formation of families. Women that come to work, similarly than in other Middle Eastern countries and East Asia countries, they are not supposed to bring in their families. There is no family reunification, even more so. They are not supposed to have babies, to, meaning to have families while working in Israel. Okay? And so the, we can actually paraphrase the very well-known Max Frisch saying, remember what Max Frisch said? Remember that? We brought workers, but we got human beings. So we can paraphrase him and say, we wanted workers, but we got mothers. And these tensions, actually, in the Israeli case, have come about very clearly in two uh, main occasions. This is one of the results of the tensions. Okay, his name is Rabbi Eliezer Cruz, and I bring his photo, okay? I don't have an ethical issue in bringing his photo because his photography was published in all the newspapers. He is what we can call, actually someone called Nicole Constable working on the same topics in Hong Kong. She calls children out of place, okay? You are having at any moment children that are born in a place where they will never, they are not recognized and they will never become recognized. And uh, this, uh, this issue of having women coming to do the reproductive labor, to take care of our families and in the most intimate situations on the one hand, but not recognize their reproductive lives, it came up in two main occasions. Okay, and this is what the articles that I sent you actually are writing about. This is where we, we find, okay, the uh, issue of why we should actually talk not just about state policies and market interest, but also about civil society. What are the, the two occasions? Just before that, sorry, the number of children, have a look. By 2005, the number, the total number of children of those that we knew of, because the, there is the same number of children that we don't know about, okay? They were very tiny, okay? Up to 2,000 children in general in the Tel Aviv area where most of them are. We don't know about other places in the country, okay? But 10 years later, even less, yeah, 10 years later, just the number of kids from, from newborn up to six has more than five times, uh, uh, grown by five times, just up to the number of, uh, to the age of six. Which means that these are, the ti this is a, these are still numbers that are not really enormous. It's a tiny numbers, but they have created a big problem or at least a big public uproar. Why and when? So I'll just mention it not to bore you, but this is where we can think why it is important to look what's going on in civil society, how civil society react actually to the presence of others, okay? Who care and why? So the two events into which this issue of the family formation was brought up was, the first one was actually in 2005, and then in 2011 with the ruling of the High Court of Justice. Uh, uh, and the second one was in anti-deportation campaigns and uh, legalization campaigns very similar to those that you know very well in Spain, some of you know from Italy uh, and France, uh, uh, that focus, actually it was an anti-deportation campaigns, but it actually focused on the legalization of children. So let me just tell you a little bit about them. The first one was actually regarding the, the High Court ruling in 2011, started in 2005 when, when NGOs working with communities 
uh, paid attention that many migrant women were uh, giving birth in their homes. So this was a new thing, things that were not known, because until then, many of them, those, the few of them that gave birth, that gave birth in hospitals, okay? And they were giving, why were they giving birth at home? This is something that could be, it's very nice when you do that with a dollar, but uh, this was not the situation, okay? It was not a yappy giving birth. So they were giving birth at homes, and that's how the NGOs learned about a procedure, an internal procedure of the Minister of Interior, that it's called the Pregnant Migrant Women a Worker Procedure. Okay, it was not public, it was not published, it was not known. According to which, uh, the uh, pregnant women, uh, sorry, foreign workers should not have, are not allowed to have their families with them in the country. This is exactly the same in places like Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and in, also in the Emirates, in Qatar, in Kuwait, and I think that also in Lebanon. Uh, actually, in the contract, isn't it so? In the contract, before they come, they have to sign, okay, that if they get, they don't have to have their families, definitely not bring their families with, but they have not to have a first relation per a family in, in the country of destination. And pregnancy and giving birth is having a first degree relation. So this is what, for example, one of, in the lower courts, in the lower courts, one of the judges said, and you can read it, you know, according to the interior ministry procedures, partners cannot work together in Israel. The detainee has a family unit to which a baby is about to join under these circumstances in which the interior ministry will not give a work permit to the detainee. I don't see that we should release her, okay? So, this is how this whole issue started, and uh, it was brought into court, and in a minute I will tell you exactly what was the way in which NGOs approached the issue on what were the results. The interesting thing is that the same time that this a pregnant a, a foreign worker procedure that was mainly for those that have visa, okay, was taking place. At the same time, in 2005, we have the first anti-deportation and legalization campaign that was actually a, a geared, was aimed mainly and was relevant mainly for the babies of migrant workers without papers, that didn't have a papers, okay? So here what we have actually is a kind of a, a paradoxical situation in which not having papers, which it's actually living in a situation of insecurity, but it could secure okay, the possibility of having your kids legalized through these campaigns, while having papers, okay, that gives you a secure job and a secure sit situation actually jeopardizes, in, hinders your possibility of having a baby, okay? So the legalization campaigns, there were two legalization campaigns, and I expect that there will be a third one very soon. And if you read in the paper so you remember, okay, one it was in 2005, and the second one is 2010, in which these were anti-deportation campaigns that brought about something that was quite unprecedented in the Israeli case. It brought about full legalization of the kids and of their families, which means that in 2005, something like 2,000 in total, 2,000 people were fully legalized and give the first a, a, a permanent resident and then citizenship, and in 2010, a similar number. Okay, so... Uh, to understand these differences between the, those women that have permits uh, but uh, uh, were unwanted mothers, okay, and those women that didn't have permits but they had their kids legalized, I go back to my main argument. We have to look seriously at the ways in which civil society organizations are actually uh, making their claims, how they are actually debating 
over which existences it is possible to legitimate, okay, strategizing on how to produce public representations of the human beings to be defended, and creating, unwittingly perhaps, also moral hierarchies of worth and inclusion in the polity. So just to be very brief, uh, and this can be found in the paper, the repertoires, the strategies of civil society organizations were very different in both uh, cases. Whereas for women with papers, the main strategy was actually de what I call deconstructing the law, okay, and actually talking about the rights of migrant women to have a family life, not as women, not as persons, not as a human right, but as a labor right, okay? In the case of the kids of undocumented migrants, the main talk was not one of rights. It was not talking to the system, to the legal system and to the political system in its own language. Actually, the demonstrations, the legalization, demonstra the legalization demonstrations did not, did barely talk about rights and even about human rights. What did they talk about? First of all, they talked mainly about children. Okay, these were the pictures, okay? Uh, what was supposed to be an anti-deportation of migrant workers campaigns, they became a children campaign these were the pictures, it was very important to show that actually these children are Israelis. This was the number of, this was the name actually of the campaigns, Israeli children, that the cultural center of their lives is in Israel, that they have developed an Israeli identity, that they have undergone assimilation, and if they would be deported, it would be actually like putting them in exile and removing them from the center of their identity. This was actually the banner, we are all Israeli children, which was a completely different strategy. Okay, this was, of course, a poster, a poster child and a poster picture for showing the assimilatory a, a, uh, uh, dynamics, or for example, the former then president uh, Shimon Peres writing to the Minister of Interior why he should give, he should legalize these kids. So he said, I heard Hebrew ring naturally from their mouth, the fact that they speak Hebrew, they went to schools, that they want so much to go into the army if they were given the opportunity to do so. And these things actually, they work very well and they are about, I think that if, if they will be played in the same way uh, in the next time, they will still be working. So this is a kind of cautionary tale also for organizations and for uh, campaigns working on trying to make the case. You can try to make the case talking about rights or talking about identity. Each one has its prices or it's straight off, okay? When you actually are talking about rights, like in the case of, uh, in the case of documented labor migrants, uh, that finally the procedure was abolished, okay? The procedure was abolished, the woman now can leave her baby in the country, but once the visa expires, she can leave the baby under two conditions. One, if the baby does not impair her, does not actually bother her to work, which means that if the employer gives the permission, okay? And the second condition is once the visa expires, she has to go together with the baby, okay? So the, uh, talking about rights, actually the pros of talking about rights is quite, uh, are quite uh, clear. You talk about rights, it means that you are talking about the universal enforcement, in this case of labor rights, okay? These are not ad hoc. It means that you are actually institutionalizing a change. You are institutionalizing a reform. It bans discrimination, not on the base of particularity, but on the base of universality. But at the same time, as I said, it reinforces the biopolitics of labor migration that sees migrant women mainly according to their instrumental value as labor, okay? Whereas the legalization campaigns, actually, they, actually what they were doing is that they were 
working mainly on particulars. Okay, they, first of all, they managed to change the, the status for some, but not for all. Yes, I'm finishing, but not for all. So it's mainly particularistic. Uh, on the other hand, it introduces new instruments into the policy toolbox, and uh, it furthers the institutionalization mainly of what? Of adokism, okay, working mainly through the humanitarian and one-time uh, exceptional, exceptional, working through the exception channel. Uh, and finally, what it does, and perhaps because of that it succeeds, is that it reinforces cultural assimil assimilationist understandings uh, of identity. So I will stop here, and uh, I will open to questions. <coughs> Thank you very much. That was quite extensive and interesting and surprising also. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I prefer to open the floor to the public, so feel free to ask for questions, comments.